Hello everybody and welcome to Beer in a Movie. Of course, this is not beer, this is wine. I wanted to ring in the new year with, uh, with an air of sophistication, hence the wine. That's not true. I'm actually sponsored today, that's why the wine. Sponsored by wine, the whole industry. The whole industry gathered together and they were like, that's the face we want as the face of our products. Not really, it's actually a company called Bright Sellers. And I got so excited about our partnership that I actually went out and bought this glass which says, I'm not drinking alone. I'm social distancing. <laughs> I bought it because I thought it would be funny, so I spent $15 on it, and now I think it's a dumb joke, and now I don't have $15. If you are unfamiliar with beer in a movie, I like to find a movie or a franchise that I find interesting. And not interesting just because of the films, but something that surrounded the film. For example, the very first beer in a movie that I ever made was about Fallen, which is a Twilight ripoff with a huge book fan base and a huge blockbuster movie budget except somehow it was just like abandoned and released on VOD. You might then guess what fascinates me about Divergent. I'm looking at this glass and I'm realizing I am wearing white pants. Uh, I don't think that was a good combination. I better start sucking away at this thing. What fascinates me about Divergent is that it was this hugely popular book series. And the first movie did so well that they just greenlit all the rest of the movies and they even took it a step further. They decided to split the final book into two movies. So they made the first film, success, green light the rest of them. They made the second film, more success. They made the third film, less success. And then they just left and didn't make the final film. Let me just explain to everybody the plot of Divergent so that no one's left behind. So at age 16 in this dystopian city, you have to choose between one of five different factions. Each faction has their own character trait. There's the smart, there's the brave, there's the selfless, there's the uh, other two. The peaceful, selfless, brave, smart, selfless, selfless, brave, smart, honest, and intelligent. Honest. They made an honest faction. That is the dumbest one. Like, oh, we only tell the truth. That's your whole life is just telling the truth? What good are you? So those are the five things that you can be in this world. You can be peaceful, honest, selfless, brave, or smart. If you are any more then one of those things, you are divergent and they kill you. That's the reason the book gained so much traction. There's a choosing ceremony, leaving your family for the first time, meeting new friends and challenges along the way, rising to the top. You know, all the basic YA tropes that the Hunger Games did a couple years earlier. Choosing ceremony, leaving your family for the first time, meeting new friends and challenges, rising to the top, it's all there. And stories have always had some of these elements but Divergent seemed uniquely inspired by the Hunger Games. And I, of course I love the Hunger Games. The problem started to set in when the author had to do anything else besides the easy tropes. Let's just boil this down in an easy to understand way. If I were to ask you what the Hunger Games was about, you would say an oppressive government makes kids fight to the death. Now let's explain the plot of Divergent. It's, um, well, if, okay, so it's like, um, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Let me actually try to explain the plot of Divergent, right? Okay. So scientists crack the code to human genetics, right? And they start taking out all the bad stuff. They take out stupidity, repetitiveness in speech, greed, violence, stupidity, repetitiveness in speech. Turns out that this genetic manipulation is actually leading to people's genetics becoming damaged rather than perfected. Actually, here's what Wiki says. It started when some brilliant scientists decided to improve people's genes through genetic splicing, make them smarter, more honest, braver, more peaceful, and selfless. But the experiment went horribly wrong. <laughs> Those who had been made smarter, braver, and more honest became cruel. Those who had became peaceful became removed, distant and attentive, and those who became more selfless became so selfless, it was unhealthy. The genetic stuff is always just super vague. The war that led to this dystopian city, super vague. Apparently it was a civil war between the genetically modified slash damaged people and then regular people. What happened in the war? Whatever happened in the war though, it left Earth looking like Mars. And sometimes it just rains toxic red rain. How? Why? Don't know. 
Facts are unimportant. Veronica Roth, the author of Divergent, actually tells a story how she wrote Divergent over winter break her senior year at Northwestern University. Now I went to a scam college that recently closed for business. That's a true story. So I had to look up what a winter break looks like for a real college. Ooh, three weeks? She wrote Divergent in three weeks. You can write a book in three weeks. Much like you can build a house in a day. But don't think that just because you put a nice painting on the wall, and a big plush rug on the floor, that suddenly your your house is good to live in. Does that metaphor make sense? I, I might be a little bit tipsy. And I know what you're thinking. It's a little bit early in the video, Dylan, to be tipsy. But I can assure you that I hold my alcohol as well as my college holds itself in business. Which is to say, not very well at all. The painting in my metaphor is supposed to be like a choosing ceremony. And the plush rug is supposed to be like a badass girl just kicking some ass. Pretty and fun things to distract you from the facts that your house will literally collapse in on itself at the slightest breeze. Anyway, the regular people gather up a bunch of the genetically damaged ones after the war and they put them in a city. They wipe their memories. Meanwhile, the regular people watch over them as an experiment to see if the genes fix themselves over time, I guess? Which is a weird experiment because the regular people, they have like super intense technology to watch over the city. So they know everything that's always going on all the time. Yet they don't do anything. They just watch like a perverse reality TV show. There's no trials, there's no interference to try to fix the genes. Instead, they just put them there and watch. It's the goddamn Truman Show. It's, that's all it is. Tris. I know you. I have been watching you your whole life. I watched you being born. I was watching when you were born. I watched a little girl have a happy childhood. I was watching when you took your first step. Okay, this is the part of the beer in the movie that's really fun. All right, we're gonna actually go over the movies now. First big thing that happens is Tris chooses Dauntless. So she leaves her faction of abnegation, everyone, <gasps> because she left her home faction, which is something that not a lot of people do, and she went to join Dauntless. Let me tell you a little something about Dauntless. Dauntless are supposed to be the brave. Because they're brave, they're always running everywhere. Obviously, I, I should have to explain this. Bravery and running are two things that just go hand in hand. So Triss has to get used to the Dauntless lifestyle, which is like the complete opposite of how she grew up. So it takes her a while. She gets her ass kicked in training until she starts kicking ass in training, but she's divergent and she can't tell anyone. Shh. We can't let Kate Winslet know, otherwise we die. Then the worst fucking thing happens. Everyone in Triss's Dauntless faction gets brainwashed. Oh no. <laughs> the brainwashing serum doesn't take effect on her because she's divergent, which makes no sense because every other fucking serum in the world works on her. This whole brainwashing scheme is led by uridite, which is the brainwashing factum. What? I gotta stop. Try again! <laughs> the whole brainwashing thing is a plot from Eurydites, which is the smart guys, to take over leadership of society from abnegation by killing everyone in abnegation. <laughs> Bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off. Four and Triss. Oh shit, I never talked about Four. Uh, okay, so Four is like the hunky fighter boyfriend whose name is Four. And I just know that the author, as soon as she thought of this character's name as Four, she leaned one shoulder forward lifted a hand, and patted herself vehemently on her back. Good job. That's so smart. Because she knew all the young fans were going to be like, Ooh, his name's Far? Mm, that's so mysterious and sexy. It's just painful to watch the end of this movie because it just removed all agency from every character. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine this instead. Tris bonds with Christina and... Uh, this guy, in all these guys, I don't remember the names, do we care? After building a tight bond through grueling training where they only had each other and they needed each other's help in order to survive and push forward, an order comes down from the leader of the faction and he says, we're moving out. We're gonna go kill all abnegation. They say faction before blood. So your faction comes first and foremost. Faction before blood. So all these characters have a decision to make. They can just fall in line and follow the orders as they're expected to do, put their faction first, or they can become an outcast and risk death in order to do the right thing. Half the group chooses to follow orders while the other half join Triss in the rebellion. And when it comes to the battlefield, Triss has a stare down with one of her close friends from training. It's a standoff. They both have their guns pointed at each other. They're both frozen because they'd have to kill a friend of theirs. And Triss pulls the trigger. Boom. 
kills her friend. Powerful stuff, right? She killed her friend in order to save her family and stop the insurrection. Is that what happens? Nope. Because this book was written in three fucking weeks. Instead, her friends are brainwashed and they can just do bad things and get away with it. And this is the problem that most YA books have. They focus so much on the protagonist and their love interest that all the other characters feel like two-dimensional playthings. She was just like, hmm, how do I get a bunch of characters who don't want to do something to do that thing that I need them to do? Hmm. I could go back and rewrite their characters a little bit so that they, uh, you know, they have like a good moral moment where they have to question their beliefs. <sighs> it's a lot of work though, and it's already Christmas, winter break's almost over, what if I, uh, brainwashing plot, got it, boom. That's how you know? Oh no. That was close. Whoo, that was close! <laughs> You see that? Anyway, Tristan 4 foiled this takeover plan. Good job, guys. Clap, clap. You are legends. Movie number two, Insurgent. Tristan 4 are on the run, and they meet up with the factionless, who are basically people that just don't fit into any single faction, so they just, they're homeless people. But shocker, they're actually an organized group preparing for a war. Wow! A group of people that were an afterthought are actually organizing a mutiny against the government. Haven't seen that plot before. Oh, what's this? District 13 enters the chat. The factionless get this. They're led by Four's mom. Because that's super convenient. What, Veronica, did you write this over the week and a half spring break you had the following year? Uh, I just realized that there is a small percent chance that Veronica might actually watch this video. Hey, hey, Veronica. Listen, hey, hey, you're a millionaire now. I'm just a guy yelling at a green screen. Who's winning? You went to Northwestern, a highly respected school. I went to a scam college and now promote wines on my channel. Just take your victory and go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is like one of the best sponsorships I've ever had. Meanwhile, there's Peter, who is simultaneously super duper important while also somehow being completely irrelevant to the plot. <laughs> I don't know how to explain this, but he does certain things in the story that are super crucial, but at the same time, if he wasn't there, things would go the exact same way if he wasn't. Now you have to remember Janine. She's like the, the villain, right? And she's the divergent killer. Peter makes the mistake of telling her this. I would like a position in your regime. Maybe Dolan's, but I'm not just a meathead. He just admitted to being more than one personality trait. So she kills him on the spot. Psych, no, she just ignores it completely. Despite him admitting that he's smart and brave at the same time. So he's two things, which would make him divergent. But he's not divergent because, uh, winter break. Yeah, she just didn't have enough time. <laughs> Damn you, Northwestern. If only you had made your winter break four weeks. Maybe she would have been able to figure this out. Long story short, the climax of the second one is when Triss turns herself in to Janine so that she can get experimented on. She's gonna try to open this cube, which is only a movie edition. That's not in the original books. I know, because I read the original books. Years ago. Don't remember a lot of it, but there was no cube. Give me credit for reading it, though. Because I did. I did my research for this video. I just did it like six years ago. <laughs> the problem is all the divergents up to this point that have tried to open the cube have died. And Triss tries to open it and she dies. Oh no, psych. She doesn't actually die. She's the protagonist. She can't die yet. <laughs> Bring her back! Peter actually shot her full of something to make her appear dead, but she's not actually dead. Peter then surprises everybody by joining Triss in four. So he spent the entire time the first movie, most of the second movie, just tormenting Triss. But now he's changing allegiances all of a sudden. Super important, pivotal moment, right? Not really. Because Triss is like, hey, instead of escaping like you had planned, what if I go back and unlock the cube, which is what I was going to do in the first place, and I'll do it in front of everybody. So Peter put his ass on the line to try to get Triss to escape. And Triss is like, mm, no thanks, I'm good. <laughs> it just does the same thing as if she were trapped. So Triss unlocks the box and it's actually a message from the outside world saying, hey, there's more people living outside your walls. I know you've been living in a lie. Come on and join us. Come outside the walls. Four's mom takes over. She's in charge now of society and she kills Kate Winslet. So Kate Winslet's out of the picture. 
Ah, this wine is really good. Let's actually take a second. Let's talk about Bright Cellars, who were kind enough to sponsor today's video. Bright Cellars is a wine club, and here's how it works. So you go to their site and you take their wine quiz, which just asks you about your tastes and your preferences. They then send you wines that they think you're gonna like. They send those wines to your door and then you try them, then go to their site and rate them. And then their algorithm takes over and it matches you to wines that they think you're gonna like even more. And it's totally customizable, whether you want four bottles of wine, six bottles of wine, whether you want it every single month, every three months. They're running an offer right now. If you use my link in the description, you get 50% off of a six bottle subscription. 50% off wines that are customized to your taste, which makes them cheaper than wines not customized to your taste. Uh, I smell a good deal here. I'm gonna be honest, this is the second bottle I've tried. Both have been phenomenal. It's also good to have wine around in case you're ever hosting or if you have guests. It makes you seem cultured. Oh, me? Yes, yes indeed, I do have wine. Would you like a glass? I have a special glass for you. It, uh, it says I'm not drinking alone, I'm social distancing. <laughs> We're laughing at pandemic humor. Ah, have a drink. Mmm, smells of culture. See how well that plays out? That could be you and your guests. Plus, maybe the best part, Bright Cellars is based out of Wisconsin. All things that are good come from Wisconsin. Except the colleges. Avoid them. Let's talk about movie three. And I will not be harsh on movie three because it is far and away the best movie of the three Divergent movies. Now, if you look at it critically, that's not true, even remotely. <laughs> but what critics aren't taking into account about this score is movie three stops caring. And it's so beautiful to watch. The first two movies were like these moody dramas that were like The Hunger Games, but worse. But there were moments in the third one where they just completely stopped giving a fuck and they just made it as campy and dumb and fun as they could. Seems like we're two peas in a pod. Case in point, orange goo. So Triss, Four, and the other unimportant characters break out of the city after there was a mandate that no one's leaving the city. Even though there was a cube that said, leave the city, we're not gonna follow that damn cube. They break out, they traverse this Mars looking ass place, and they reach a wall, an invisible wall, and it opens up and a bunch of soldiers come out to greet them. And they're like, hey, you're Triss, nice to meet you. Wanna come back to our place? We got wine, you can drink all you want. And instead of putting Triss and Four into these giant ships with like tons of space, they instead say, hold still, and they send out these orange plasma globes that give Triss and Four the power of flight. Oh, you need to be decontaminated? No problem. Let's just shower you in orange goop. At first I thought, this is so dumb. And then I thought, hold on a second. This is genius because it's so dumb that it suddenly became fun. And Four decides that this new society, it's not so great because sometimes they go on missions out into the wilds. And there's people living in like small little makeshift cities Horrible living, right? So the soldiers of the city go out, just evil soldiers. They go out and they round up the kids, horrible, and then they bring them back to the city where the kids are well fed and they live longer and have access to medical supplies and they just live better lives. It's horrible stuff, really. <laughs> Four's like, I'm not having any of that. I want these kids living in poverty. Let's fucking overthrow the society. And unfortunately for him, the society that he's rebelling against also tries to assassinate him. But don't worry, Four is like a super badass. So he takes on like a whole ship of guys with again his bare hands and he wins because he's a badass protagonist. But he accidentally shoots the pilots as well. So the ship falls thousands of feet out of the sky and crashes into the ground where there's an explosion. Which of course leaves Four with some pretty serious injuries. As you can see, he's got a slight limp now, which are the injuries you get after you fall thousands of feet from the sky and crash and burn into the ground. And he wasn't even strapped in either. He was just hanging on. And he's like, ah, oh, darn, I got a, I got a little, I got a little ache in my thigh. Ah, this is gonna, it's gonna be here for days. What a nightmare. Triss at first likes the, the guy that's running the experiments. She's getting along with him. He's telling her things about her mother that she never knew. But then she realizes that 
as the city's about to go to war, there's another war brewing within the city between Four's mom and then there's another faction leader who's like rising up. And Triss is like, hey man, can you intervene and stop this war? And the dude's like, nah, <laughs> no, I'm good. Triss takes matters into her own hands by stealing the guy's private aircraft and hilarity ensues. I'm going manual. <laughs> whoa, 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 crazy. There is literally a wacky zany car chase scene. I love it. I love it. I love how Triss is like, I'm gonna have to override autopilot and take this thing manual. Despite not knowing that flying vehicles existed like three days ago. And now she's gonna take over this super advanced technology and fly this ship away from pursuers who are trained in flying these vehicles. I love their constant screaming. I love the fact that they're getting missiles shot at them. And you know, you just know that they are gonna break through the wall in the nick of time. I just love everything about it. It's grade A garbage. Ah, uh, I don't think I'd call it garbage because it's so good. I'd call it garbage. That's when garbage is good. It's garbage. So now the leader guy is like, oh no, Triss is gonna go back and tell everybody about the experiment. So I'm gonna release a memory wiping serum and just wipe everybody inside the city's memory. But don't worry, Triss stops him because she's badass girl. Except she didn't really stop him because it's an airborne gas and it clearly gets into the air. <laughs> but the movie thought that like having orange smoke looked really cool. So they wanted you to ignore the fact that everyone is clearly breathing this in. But it's fine because they, they shut it off halfway through. So I guess that no one lost their memory. So all of this is setting up to the climax. Two and a half books have been building to this moment. All we have left is the climax of the totality of the story. Everything that you've been building to, all the character interactions coming to a head, all contained in this fourth and final movie, and it's fucking canceled. But don't let it get lost on you how ironic it is that the climax of the third movie is about a memory wiping drug. And then the movie studio that's making the series completely forgets about the franchise. <laughs> it's just perfect irony. Hello, you think you can ditch me like this? Yes. I wanted to get to the bottom of this. It's like the greatest blue balls in recent cinema history. To build up three movies to a point of just finishing it off with one final movie, and you're like, I don't want to do it. First film comes out, boom, $288 million. But we need to understand this figure a little bit better. Whenever you see how much a movie has earned, half that amount. Because when a movie releases to theaters, the theaters need to take their cut, which is between 30 and 50%. So let's just say 50% of the ticket sales went to the movie theaters. The budget of the first Divergent film was $85 million. Now the budget doesn't include marketing costs, so add another 50 million onto that 85 million and you still have a handy profit for the studio. The next one had a bigger budget, 110 million, and it made 297 million. I don't know how much they spent on marketing, but it still did pretty well. Only uh-oh, they released the third one and it made 100 million dollars less. So now the studio starts freaking out. Then they have a couple options here. They can pull back the budget on the final film, maybe pull back on marketing as well try to break even. They can maybe pull back on budget a little bit and then spend more money on marketing the epic conclusion to this fantastic story. You know, you could put a whole campaign around the conclusion. You could cancel the movie and make zero dollars, which is dumb. You don't want to do that. Or you can try some wild shit. They went with the wild shit. They decided to lower the budgets and then release the movie as a TV movie on Stars Network. They were planning on writing in some new characters into the final film and then do a spin-off TV show with those new characters, just to try to milk the franchise for everything it's worth. But you have to keep in mind that this was in 2016. No big movies were coming out straight to VOD. And the optics of that were horrible because the first three movies got theatrical releases. And now you want to take the series climax, what you've been building towards out of theaters? All of the actors opted out because you don't want to regress. You don't want to make a film for less money and it's going to look worse and it's gonna release on TV and no one's gonna watch it really. That just looks horrible. None of them wanted to do it. So they all opted out and the studio had no choice but to cancel the series. So now we know the technical reason why it was canceled. But 
why? Why? Why did people start losing interest in that third movie? To be fair to Divergence, The Hunger Games suffered as well. As each movie went on, it started making less and less money. Most people pick up these series for the enticing concepts. Once you complete that enticing concepts, you have to latch on to their interests and build a world that maintains their interest throughout the rest of the story. The problem with Divergent and The Hunger Games is outside of the concept, the rest of the story is not that great. The author had no plan for the series when she started writing. She just wanted to write a cool book about factions and a choosing ceremony and fighting over the course of her winter break. And then everyone looked at it like it was gold. And you know she had no plan because you come to find out that the factions, the whole concept of the first book the reason it, it sold in the first place, they mean nothing. The whole city experiment is about fixing people's genetics. Putting people into factions based on their personalities has nothing to do with that whatsoever. The factions are there just to maintain order, I guess, because that's the only way that you maintain order is by having factions of people separated, which works super well. I mean, they had multiple wars. So, that, so the faction system really worked out Oh my god. Let me just make sure I am absolutely clear here. The world of Divergent is flawed from its very concept point. The Bureau of Genetic Welfare, they're the ones overseeing the Chicago experiments. Their goal is to get Divergence, people who are not broken genetically. The Bureau is the one that set up the faction system. They said they did that in order to maintain peace. However, the faction system encourages people to only be one thing, which is the antithesis of progress for the experiment. Also, why would you let someone who's known as the divergent killer run loose? She is literally a cancer within your experiment. She is killing off all the progress that you are making. She is literally wiping out the whole reason you have the experiment in the first place. The author put the faction system in because it was like a cool sorting hat moment, but she could never figure out how it related to the bigger picture story. She was never able to connect the dots within her own story. The series falls apart, and I think the reason the last film failed so hard is because the series lacked one of the most vital elements that you can have in a story, and that is a good villain. She never added someone to root against. And they added Kate Winslet into the movies, but the character she plays in the books doesn't really come around much until book two. And even at that point, she's not really a compelling villain in the second one either. And then she's defeated at the end of the second one. And then at the start of the third one, there's like a, a friendly guy who kind of morphs into the villain by the end of the third one but he's not scary or threatening in any way, so he's a horrible villain. You can have a convoluted world with characters doing stuff that you don't agree with and stuff that, that doesn't really make any sense, as long as you have a powerful opponent that you want to see toppled and defeated. So we didn't really care if Triss accomplished her goal because what was her goal? Who was she fighting against? The man in charge of the experiments? He's a small fish in a bigger pond. He answered, to a larger government who had approved the city experiment. So we're just gonna pretend like we wrapped up the story neatly because the guy who's in charge of the experiment is dead now? Wouldn't the powers that be just send another person to overlook the experiment? I... <laughs> That's the story of Divergent and its premature end. Unfortunately, the series at this point is dead and I don't see it being revitalized because the fad of YA dystopian stuff is over. And by this point, the actors have aged a number of years, so I don't see them coming back and making the final film. And I don't think there's a demand for it either, which is a shame because you'd love to see it completed. Whether you like the series, hate the series, at least it's a full thing. With Divergent, it's just this weird pseudo ending like a canceled TV show that'll never come back. I hope you enjoyed this beer in a movie. If you'd like to get your own wine, I'll leave that link in the description. It's 50% off, so it's cheaper than most wines. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time, where I'll probably talk about Megan Fox and the Transformers series. Because what the fuck happened there? Michael Bay, Megan Fox, see you later.